Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm actually from the University of Southampton now, as you can see from my opening uh, slide. But um, I'm actually going to present by, um, a brief overview of my master's research and results that I conducted at the University of Manchester in 2016. So almost, it's also worth noting, as Donald mentioned, that the, some of these results are probably out of date as well now at this point. Um, but particular attention will be given um, to the disciplinary trends and visual assumptions identified within the different visual modalities utilised in the context of the museum. And then the final section of the presentation will briefly discuss future directions of my research at PhD level and the application of new vocabularies in an attempt to challenge old narratives about the prehistoric past. I suggest that the only way to challenge this is to actually present new and innovative ways of representing the Paleolithic that are founded on emotional and relational biographies. So I would just like to, for a moment, for everyone to look at this image. This is the image of Wookie Cole, created by H.M. Hutchinson in 1896. And this is a very powerful image and probably the main reason why I'm studying the number representation of women in the Paleolithic. When I first saw this image, I must admit I was actually disgusted in our role I was like, this is really bad. Um, the pictorial reconstruction features several of the stereotypical and gender-specific characteristics which are used to demonstrate secondary sexual difference in the representation of human antiquity. As you can see, the female is positioned in the background of the image, literally faceless, overshadowed by the crevice of the cave. And the male takes centre stage. He is depicted as not only the hunter, he is the inventor, he is the creator. He is the motivator of human evolution. Um, the female assumes obviously a more passive and stereotypically nurturing role than the male counterparts and are almost exclusively associated with children. Children in this perspective are almost seen as material culture in themselves. They are not individuals. They are almost always associated with the female. So basically I looked at three international case studies, the Natural History Museum in London, the Museum of Human Evolution in Burgos, Spain, and I looked at the Prehistory Museum in the Dordogne Valley in France. And I think this quote by Clive Gamble is very important. Viewing prehistory is only possible because we've been taught how to look and learn. And I would argue that we must consider the historical lens through which it has been viewed. And obviously, this is basically the standard as to what has been set for, well, over 100 years later. Um, so the long-standing and persistent gender biases within prehistoric archaeology and models of evolution have consistently positioned adult males as central to archaeological investigation, interpretation and representation, while females have been placed firmly on the periphery. There has been also a considerable lack of research into the highly formulaic and restrictive scenarios presented within the context of the museum, particularly with regard to emotion and identity. And I argue this only limits our understanding of the multifaceted and multidimensional character of social and material relationships throughout human antiquity. It is now widely recognised that if we are to understand how people and things bring their worlds into being, we are, we are required to critically engage with emotion. It appears, following Clark Gamble, that the time has come to present the driving factor of evolution, not in terms of technological or cultural progression, rather a focus on emotional biographies, and emotional biographies in the context of my work should be understood as a relational ontology that focuses on the interconnected social relations and intimacies between individuals, matter, materials, substances, and space. So using these three major museological um, examples, I will actually demonstrate that despite major critiques and movements against the traditional and gender-specific iconography faculty during the 1990s by lots of amazing um, a female archaeologist actually in the profession. So we have Margaret Conkey, we've got Stephanie Moser, we've got Zilha, all of them really in the 1990s critiqued this situation and said this needs to change. So my research questions were simple. Has it changed? Have we moved on from this? Has the museum actually taken this into consideration when they're representing Paleolithic? And unfortunately, they haven't. <laughs> so um, I analysed the National Museums, um, which was included here, um, and I looked at several variables, quite different to Felicity's variables actually. I looked at history and architecture. 
I looked at the exhibition design and layout, and then I looked specifically at analysing the visual modalities. But for the, focus of, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on exhibition design and the visual modalities, otherwise I'll be here forever. So the Natural History Museum in the London, UK. Um, the Gallery of Human Evolution at the Natural History Museum does not have a didactic or epistolar. You know what I mean, people. <laughs> Rather, the aim of the exhibition is to, sass, is to display star specimens from the museum's collection and recent research in a scientific and objective manner. And I believe that in, in, in retro perspective, that this is actually why they fell short in the representation of females. Because they focused purely on geographical locations, the bones, and they didn't actually think of the wider narrative. The gallery is characterised as theoretically organised with no prescribed route for the visitor to follow. Actually, it can be quite confusing as to which bit you're supposed to be going into. Instead, the visitor can freely explore four scientific zones that present our most ancient ancestors within an evolutionary interpretive framework. Gender stereotyping and the use of highly formulated scenarios was difficult to assess here because they didn't actually reconstruct Paleolithic life. There was no multi-behaviour models. They only had single reconstructions like this. Very fantastic, but that's all that there was. So the gallery is centred on two types of visual modality, that of anatomical reconstruction in the middle and scientific, as I've termed these hyper-realistic living mannequins. Um, and the two key representations are the homo neanderthal male here on the left and the homo sapien male on the right. And they are standalone living mannequins, individually cased but facing each other, almost glancing one another across the gallery. And these particular reconstructions successfully challenge the primitive iconography, that sticky caveman stereotype, which is so dangerous with being attached to home in the Neanderthal. However, um, they take centre stage in the gallery, and despite successfully challenging negative notions of race and identity, particularly with the Homo sapien, uh, the imposing nature of these hyper-realistic reconstructions subconsciously so places males at the centre of the gallery and at the centre of evolution. Because when you walk in, there are no females. The, the females are anatomical reconstructions in the side cases, and they have these big, massive reconstructions, which, let me just also mention, cost over £120,000. So it seems that they also financially like to invest in the male role in human evolution. <laughs> um, so a clear trend can be identified here and females dominate the anatomical reconstruction, which is quite sad, really. Um, and in the hyper-realistic ones, the males dominate always consistently. And I argue that this renders women of little note in the study of prehistory. Anatomical reconstruction is like a realistic, personal and relatable element that is needed to provide the room to successfully challenge a gender coded iconography of the Paleolithic. But say this sadly is where the females were included in these scientific reconstructions, it was the white thermoplastic heads that, even though they've been reconstructed, they still lack that kind of relatability. So, on to the next case study, and I do apologise for going through these at rapid speed. So, if there are any questions, please ask me later. The second museum is the Muse National de Prehistory in the Dordogne Valley, France. Um, the architecture and the situational positioning of the museum clearly reflects the role and the purpose of the space. It mirrors the prehistoric world and archaeological sites around it, enabling the museum to serve as a speaking monument. The museum design and layout can be characterised as a linear journey of technological and cultural progression through the ages. A visitor's journey starts in the entrance, which is flooded with light, and he or she enters the subdued atmosphere of the lobby area and continues through the dimly lit access tunnel that allows the visitor to literally retread and walk in the shoes of the little footprints, which I thought was a fantastic element, it was really nice. And at the end of the access tunnel, the visitor is immediately confronted with a scientific reconstruction of Homo erectus, who throughout my analysis is always presented as male, which is convenient. The lower gallery then takes the visitor on a chronological journey through time, focusing specifically on functionality and matters of survival rather than cultural affairs. Although, it is, although within this gallery, it should be stated that the visitor is confronted with a very interesting anomaly to the traditional gender iconography. Here, you will find the life-size reconstruction of a Neanderthal man and baby, um, situated within a cave setting, but there is no female present. So this is an exemplary example of role reversal. Unfortunately, the ever-restricted scenario of a cave setting for a dwelling and stone tools for the technology are also present. 
After ascending up the staircase to the final gallery, the visitor is immediately confronted with a white adult male throwing a half his spear. The performative action of walking up the stairs, um, up the staircase to reach this gallery and a direct association to cultural materials in the sanctuary implicitly suggests that the white homo sapien male is the pinnacle of human evolution. So we're able to demonstrate that actually within this analysis, within the museum, there was not a single female. <laughs> not one. So, but, so statistics can lie, okay? Because statistically speaking, there was very bad at representing the female role. But actually, when you analyze the display, it did engage with gender. Um, but the museum does continue to posit matters both the objects and the subjects of knowledge, rendering the female role in human evolution as inferior or minimal. This is highlighted by the lack of scientific reconstructions and the fact that only males have been fleshed out within this museum. And really quickly, at the Pole International EU Lamprey History, which is an international centre of research just up the road, there are further three reconstructions, only one female, which is always Lucy. Then you've got a Homo sapien and a Homo neanderthal. The neanderthal obviously associated with functionality, a hair in one hand and a spear in the other. And the, and the homo sapien male is sat down mixing his pigments after his arduous journey through the struggle of evolution. So I will move on to my final case study. Um, I, it is noted that within the, um, the prehistory of France, they're very traditional in their type of display. Now, the Museum of Human Evolution in Burgos, Spain, this was a fantastic museum, purpose built and site specific. So they didn't have the same sort of problems that the other museums had as being a byproduct of modernity, basically. Um, so they successfully challenged the primitive iconographer throughout. You know, they didn't present caveman as a stereotype whatsoever. Um, but gender stereotyping was a persistent problem, and specifically when you go back to traditional modes of visualization. So in the pictorial representations and the dioramas, gender stereotyping was very prevalent. Um, but there was a very nice um, anomaly to this, which is the Human Evolution Gallery. If anybody hasn't seen it, please go and see it. It's amazing. There's 10, 10 hominid species um, represented basically from all the way from Australopithecus all the way up to um, Homo rudidensis in a circular layout. Um, and this successfully challenges the kind of linear progression as you can see here in the jet that you can kind of go in and out and move in between the, the ones so it becomes a discovered space for learning. But when you actually analyse the gallery more closely, you see that basically women are always associated with nature. And by that, they are always represented as the most earliest species. So they're always Australopithecus or Homo georgicus. And I found it very interesting that the first male to appear in the gallery was Paranthropus Bose, which is the hominid which is universally accepted to have been the first song filmmaker. And he stood there with a pondering expression, overlooking the gallery, again, being shown as the kind of motivator of evolution. So I'm going to have to move on really quickly because I'm running out of time. Trends and assumptions, as I've kind of already demonstrated, as you can see, females really dominate the earlier species, and then males dominate. Homo antecedent gives a little bit of a skewed um, representation as the Museum of Human Evolution focused specifically on that hominid. But the visual trends are very simple. Women are reconstructed anatomically, and males are reconstructed scientifically. Thank you. Um, so has the situation changed? I would argue not. We are still in the background. We are still faceless. We are still not in the forefront of the cave image. Don't even get me started on the restrictive scenarios. We need to be moving away from these. Um, I'm really running out of time, so rethinking. You're okay, no worries. Rethinking. Rethinking gender and materials. So where do we go from this? I've managed to demonstrate and another anomalies to this. I do understand that and our museums who are doing a fantastic job. But these are nationally important museums, and if not Europeanly important. So that in itself shows there is still a major problem. So I think that basically the problem is that many museums feel like that they have to produce a kind of safe and expected reconstruction. We've already spoke about this. There's a certain expectation, and if the museum doesn't meet that expectation, they're really nervous about kind of breaking away from that. So I draw on concepts of new materialism and the ontological turn. This is really popular at the moment. Everyone's about the meshworks and 
The bit we can't see, really. The bit back in the archaeological record, Hawke says, it's not possible. And I think that we should focus on um, emotions, and if that might, in, not a checklist, I don't want to see, you know, people being happy or people being sad. What I want to see is just communicating with each other. And so that kind of idea of the footprints and 49 individuals. Why are we recreating 49 individuals, talking to each other, walking through the landscape? Things like that is more what I would like to see. As you can see, I've still got pages and pages left, but I've only got the time, and I hope that you can appreciate what I'm trying to do, which is reframe how we think about gender, representation, performing engagement, and emotional biographies in the paper like this. Thank you. Thank you.